Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on the Meyerson Satterthwaite theorem. It is a very general realization about what must be true in negotiations involving uncertainty. Of course, negotiations with incomplete information and that sort of uncertainty is a subject that I talk a lot about in Game Theory 101 Bargaining, although I leave the Meyerson Satterthwaite theorem out of it because it is really technical. On the other hand, it is super cool, which is why we're doing it here right now in this lecture. So just to give you some background about what we're doing here and why we should care, in the last few lectures, we have seen that bargaining can break down with asymmetric information. If I don't know what your value is for the good, I might offer you an amount that is insufficient to get you to either agree to it in terms of selling me the car or accepting the job offer at that particular wage that I'm offering you, something of that sort. Well, you might be wondering whether this inability to reach an agreement was just the result of the bargaining pro protocol that we were analyzing, right? We focused mostly on ultimatum games since we finished our unit on Rubenstein bargaining. Maybe it's the case that the inability to reach an agreement is a result of playing an ultimatum game. Or maybe it's because of the particular beliefs about the types of the other player that we had for that particular model. What if we had a different sort of setup? Would we expect to see the same sort of inefficiency? Remembering, of course, that bargaining breakdown is bad. It's really bad for the world because it means that there are situations where we would have both been better off had we come up with an agreement, and yet we're not actually reaching that agreement. So is it just the result of the model that we were looking at? Was it an artifact of the model that we were looking at? Or are we actually getting at something deeper about negotiations? Well, as we're going to see, the truth is that we actually found something pretty deep about negotiations. It doesn't matter how we go about changing this, we're still going to get results that say bargaining has to result in some sort of inefficiency. So you might think about alternative bargaining protocols, right? There are these po other possibilities, other ways that we could negotiate. Instead of me giving you an ultimatum offer, maybe I made you an offer and then you made an offer back to me if you didn't like that. And then if I didn't like that offer, I make an offer to you and so forth. Uh, maybe before you make any offers at all, you tell me, hey, you know, I'm actually this really strong type. Maybe you should give me a little bit more. Or maybe you first make me an offer and then if I reject it, I can send you a message to say, hey, you know what, you should offer me this amount instead. And then after that, you make another offer to me, having heard what I said that you should make an offer in terms of and so forth, right? So there are a whole bunch of different bargaining protocol that we could choose from. And what we want to be able to do is make a statement about all of these different bargaining protocol, not only the ones that you see on the screen here, not only the one that we've been looking at previously in the form of the ultimatum game, but all of those bargaining protocol. The problem is that there are infinitely many such bargaining protocol possible. So if we were to analyze those sorts of bargaining protocol one at a time, like we did with the ultimatum game, if we did that with alternating offers and then with some messages exchanged and then an offer being given and so forth, we'd be here for literally ever. There are infinitely many possible bargaining protocols, so that's a bad way of doing business. The good news is that there is a way to analyze all of those things at once. So mechanism design is a tool that shows what must be true in all games of a certain class. So here, because this is a course on bargaining, the class of games that we're interested in are these negotiation situations, these bargaining situations, where there's a buyer of a good and a seller of a good, and the buyer is offering a price to the seller or must give an amount of money to the seller in exchange for the good. So this mechanism design allows us to say something about all of those bargaining protocols that are possible all at once. And obviously this is a really neat tool if you're able to say something about everything in the world in one fell swoop, that's pretty worthy of say a Nobel Prize. And in fact, the people who came up with mechanism design and laid the foundations of mechanism design won a Nobel Prize for that. So what our setup here is for this bargaining game, what is going to allow us to say everything about all possible bargaining protocol is the following setup. And this is actually fairly minimalistic. So suppose that we have a buyer and a seller and the buyer of the good has a value of the good between XB and YB. 
So X is the smallest amount that the buyer actually values the good. Y B is the highest amount that the seller, or rather the buyer, could possibly value the good with those subscript Bs indicating, of course, that those are the buyer's amounts. And the seller, meanwhile, has a similar story going on here where the seller might value the good anywhere between X sub S and Y sub S where X is the smallest amount that the seller is going to value the good at, and Y is the largest amount that the seller could value the good at. And the only thing that we're going to require about these different values is that the YB, the highest amount that the buyer is valuing the good at, is going to be greater than the smallest amount that the seller could possibly value the good at. Essentially what that YB greater than XS uh, requirement is selling, uh, or rather showing us or telling us, is that there is some sort of agreement that could be possible between these guys. If it weren't the case that YB was greater than XS, then the buyer would never want to purchase the good from the seller because the buyer would have to spend so much on the good that it would not actually be worth it for the buyer to buy it at that price. All right, so all that first bullet point is saying is suppose that we're in a situation where it's possible that uh, these guys should be trading with each other, that there would be efficient trades to be made if we had a buyer and a seller in front of us. And with the second bullet point is going to focus on uncertainty. So we need to have some sort of uncertainty about the situation. That's what we've been covering in this unit. And the uncertainty that we have in this situation is that the buyer and seller know their own values. So if I'm a buyer, I know whether I'm closer to the XB side of things or the YB side of things. I know my actual value of the good. If you're the seller, you know your own actual value of the good, whether you're closer to XS or YS. You know the exact value for yourself. But I only know that you're somewhere on XS and XS. XY, and you know that I'm somewhere on XB and YB, but neither one of us is sure exactly where the other one is on our continuous probability distribution. All right, so that's the setup. Really not much of a setup here at all. I never said anything about how exactly we're negotiating. I didn't say that this is going to be an ultimatum game. I didn't say this is going to be some sort of alternating offers protocol. All we care about is this informational structure. And with just that informational structure, we have something known as the Meyerson Satterthwaite theorem, which says something really deep about bargaining with incomplete information. So Meyerson Satterthwaite says that all individually rational, non subsidized, incentive compatible mechanisms are inefficient. So that's a whole lot of jargon. So let's work through each one of these points one by one and figure out what this sentence actually means. So we have all mechanisms here. So all mechanisms, what that means is we're thinking about every single way possible to negotiate with each other, all right? Doesn't matter if we're talking about an ultimatum game, doesn't matter if we're thinking about alternating offers, we're talking about all of those at one single time. It's really miraculous that we can do that, but hey, we're doing it because we can, and you know, some people are really smart and figured out that we could do that sort of thing. All right, we also have this statement that says individually rational. So we're talking about all bargaining protocol that individuals would actually want to participate in. So these individuals, before they actually participate in this negotiation game, are allowed to see how the negotiations are going to be structured, whether it's going to be an alternating offers game or a cheap talk message and then an offer or just a straight up ultimatum game. They're going to be able to see this ahead of time and they know their own value for the good. So they can think about how this game is going to play out. And if they think that by playing this game, they're going to be stuck with a price or a value uh, at the end of the game that is going to be worse for them than if they didn't participate at all, then they're allowed to not participate. So we're specifically looking for mechanisms out there that individuals would want to rationally participate in. So we're trying to structure bargaining in a way that they would actually want to bargain in that way. All right, non-subsidized. Well, that's an actual, uh, actually pretty easy to understand. Non-subsidized means that we're not paying people to participate in these negotiations. They're willing to negotiate on their own. The buyer is willing to negotiate because he expects to be able to get the product at a good price. And the seller is participating because she expects to be selling the good at a good price for herself. So we're not paying people to participate in trade here. 
And lastly, we have this phrase incentive compatible. So what does incentive compatible mean? Well, we're looking at situations where the players will actually play the game strategically. This is, of course, about strategic bargaining, so it would be silly if we were looking at bargaining protocol where we assume that once the players start playing the game that their brains shut off and they just go into, like, autopilot and they don't actually do anything smart over the course of negotiations. So that's what all of the prerequisites of the Satter Gibber or rather Meyerson Satterthwaite theorem. There's another very famous theorem called the Gibbard Satterthwaite theorem, which is why I said Gibbard accidentally there. We're talking about the Meyerson Satterthwaite theorem here, though. And what we have compiled so far say says that every single one of those mechanisms must be inefficient. So if we have a bargaining, a way of bargaining, a bargaining protocol, a method of bargaining that individuals would actually want to participate in, that we would not bribe those individuals to convince them to participate, and doesn't require those individuals to be stupid or shut off their brains while they're bargaining, then every single way we could have individuals bargain in that manner will result in some chance that trade will fail, even though after the fact we could have had a trade that would have left both of the parties better off than if bargaining had broken down. Now that might not seem like much, but let me recast what we've just found here with the Meyerson Satterthwaite theorem. The Meyerson Satterthwaite theorem says that the inefficiency results that we've been seeing in these games with asymmetric information, with incomplete information, those are unavoidable in negotiations. Anytime you have uncertainty about the other side's price and the other side has uncertainty about your price, you're getting yourself stuck in a situation where there is some chance that negotiations won't work out, even though after the fact, if you actually found out how much the other guy valued the product and he found out how much you valued the product, you'd actually be able to reach an agreement. Another way of thinking about this is applying it to the real world. What does this tell us about what's going on in the real world? Well, if you think about labor strikes, if you think about government shutdowns, if you think about wars, heck, if you think about your inability to negotiate a price for the car from the car dealer that you just went to, if you thought that those things had to be the result of some crazy irrational behavior, no. Meyerson Satterthwaite tells us that this is an unavoidable outcome of negotiations. This doesn't necessarily result from irrational behavior or a bad way of structuring negotiations, if we're thinking about this in terms of a labor strike or a government shutdown. No, no, that's not the case. It's not the case that this is the result of just stupidity and bad behavior. In fact, if you negotiate in this way, if there's any sort of uncertainty about the other side's type and they are uncertain about your type, then you are unavoidable avoidably going to have some sort of inefficient outcome possible. You just can't get away from this fact that bargaining might result in inefficient outcomes. Now, the good news here is that we haven't really talked about how inefficient an outcome has to be. And so we're going to see in the next lecture that despite the fact that negotiations guarantee us some likelihood of bargaining breakdown, there are some ways we can mitigate that and reduce the amount that bargaining breakdown is actually going to hurt us. So I hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you next time. Take care.